for this session. Good afternoon. My name is Carolina Peña, and we would like to give you a welcoming for this important conversation that we have on climate change and mental health. Um, as we wait for a minute to wait for others so we can start this conversation. So I hope that uh, we want to be able to have um, a very uh, compelling um, conversation as we were putting together with my colleagues. So let's gonna wait for a minute to see others to join us. So happy Monday to everybody. I'm very excited to, to say that Moms Clean Air Force and Ecomadres are very honored to participate in this year Latino Advocacy Week. Um, in today's conversation, uh, we will discuss the intersection between climate change and mental health and how that is affect our communities and in the US, but also in other countries. So um, we will share also some areas that we could cope with that, some strategies and how we can live in this changing climate. So very welcome today. Uh, we wanna share with you, as I said, I'm gonna be joining this conversation with two of my colleagues. Um, so next one. <laughs> uh, perfect, uh, thank you, Liz. Um, so bienvenidos. So we are speaking today from the unceded lands of the Anacostan and P Pistacaway people on what is now called Washington DC in the United States. So again, my name is Carolina Peña. I'm the Ecomadres Program Manager of the Latino Outreach Program of Moms Clean Air Force. My job in, in Ecomadres is to, to equip and provide information and tools for our communities and how they could understand the importance of the relationship between what is happening in our climate, in the pollution, and how it affects directly to our health. So I'm Bolivian, and I am living in Arlington, Virginia. So I want to invite now to my colleague, Elizabeth, to give some few words. Welcome. My name is Elizabeth Deschard. I am a senior policy analyst with Moms Clean Air Force. I work on air pollution and climate policy work with the Environmental Protection Agency and also lead Moms work at the intersection of climate change and mental health. And I live on the unceded lands of the Abenaki people uh, in what is now known uh, as Essex, Vermont. And welcome everyone. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas. My name is Liz Hurtado. I manage our vibrant network of field coordinators at Ecomadres across the country. Um, and my background really is in the intersectionality of health equity um, as it relates to the diverse representation needs, primarily within Latino communities um, through community engagement, education, and advocacy. And I am uh, originally from Peru, and I currently live in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Fantastic, thank you. So you have two proud Latinas here in this conversation. So what is Ecomadres? So Ecomadres is a program of Moms Clean Air Force, which we are a national community of more than 1.5 million parents and caregivers united with a common goal to reduce the pollution and how we can share together solutions that could protect the health of our children and the families. So our mission collectively is that we are working with Latina community members like moms, dad, daughters, aunts, cousins, and madrinas, como yo. It's basically to advocate and educate and amplify the importance to address the demands for clean air and better health. 
next one. Thank you. We're going to jump into a poll. So you can feel free to raise your hands, share this out loud, or even type it into the chat. But when you think about climate change, what is the first word or emotion that comes to mind? And I'll give folks a few seconds to think about it. But real quick, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Are we going to read? Yeah. <laughs> Anxiety, scary, overwhelming. Action. I like that one. Immigration, certainly. Advocacy. Action needed to address climate change. Excellent. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, a lot of um, fears and anxieties, as you have named, that may come to mind when you think about climate change. Um, a lot of us are feeling these feelings of anxiety or distress. And if you're feeling worried about climate change, just know that you're not alone. I love this next quote here from Isaiah Hernandez. He's an environmental educator and youth climate activist. Um, and it states, I've learned it's okay and important to be anxious about the climate crisis and that many others feel the same. When I allow myself to be emotional, it makes me more resilient as an individual and strengthens my connection with these issues. So as we very well know, there does exist a stigma around mental health within Latino communities. And this results in an overall lack of information and often leads to people not seeking treatment. So we are here today to tell you that these feelings are valid and there is a space to talk about them. So when we talk about mental health, it can be helpful to ground uh, in a shared definition uh, at the beginning. And I love this definition from the World Health Organization uh, that says mental health is a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with the stresses of life, realize their abilities, learn and work well, and contribute to their community. So it's not just about the absence of diagnosable conditions like anxiety or depression, although those are important. When we're talking about mental health here today, we're also talking about our capacity to thrive and have a sense of, of meaning and purpose in life. And I, and I appreciate too that this definition underlines that mental health is a basic human right. Slide. We know that the mental health impact of climate change is growing and there is increasing mainstream acknowledgement of this. I'm imagining that probably everybody in this virtual room has seen uh, some media headlines with words like eco-anxiety or climate anxiety, climate grief. We're going to get to those words a little bit later in the presentation. Um, last year, the uh, publication of the Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change, or IPCC, report acknowledged the mental health impacts of climate change for the first time, which was quite significant. And just this month, another iteration of the same report was published and also named the mental health impacts of climate change. There's new research coming about, out about this topic all the time, but there are still a lot of gaps uh, in our knowledge and a lot for us to learn. So when we think about the mental health impacts of climate change, we can loosely categorize them as direct versus indirect impacts. And when we talk about direct mental health impacts of climate change, we're really talking about uh, impacts that are related to direct personal experience with climate related events. So living through a wildfire, living through a hurricane, uh, being affected by by storms or sea level rise, those kinds of things. Um, just a few years ago, uh, about 42% of people in the US reported personally experiencing the impacts of global warming. And just a year later, more than four in 10 people in this country lived in a county that was struck by, by climate-related extreme weather. So either you know we've experienced this ourselves already, or we know and we love someone who has. And according to the American Public Health Association, up to 54% of adults and 45% of children uh, suffer depression after a disaster. And this is just one of many of the mental health impacts that can, uh, that can occur. There are others, right? So when, when people experience uh, extreme weather events driven by climate change, there can be trauma, there can be shock, there can be post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD from living through a, a frightening event. People lose homes, personal property, and beloved community spaces. I'm thinking about um, 
the images that we've seen just this week of a tornado uh, ripping through communities in Mississippi and how um, how devastated those communities have been. Uh, there can be anxiety and depression in the wake of these extreme weather events, disrupted healthcare systems, including uh, services that uh, provide uh, mental health care support and medications for mental health care. Um, climate uh, migration and displacement is a huge topic uh, that deserves its own um, uh, discussion, but it is closely related uh, to the mental health impacts of climate change can be very traumatic. Uh, we know that after extreme weather events, there can be increased risk of things like suicidality, risky behavior, uh, increased uh, uh, community violence and straining of social ties. So uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of impacts that can occur. Some of the other direct mental health impacts of climate change include its impact on our, on our bodies, our physiology. So we know that experiencing a direct exposure to extreme heat, higher temperatures has been linked to uh, a number of mood and anxiety disorders, uh, increased use of emergency mental health services, uh, again, increased violence uh, and interpersonal aggression. Uh, one of the things that I find really troubling is that, you know, some of the medications that providers use to treat mental illness uh, may make people more vulnerable uh, to the impacts of, of extreme heat. And of course, uh, when medicines are exposed to extreme heat, sometimes they don't work as well. So there's a lot of complex uh, interactions there. Um, and we know that air pollution, uh, which is a closely uh, linked issue to climate change, uh, is also linked to, uh, to impacts on our mental health, uh, like increased anxiety, increased uh, depression, uh, and other um, uh, profound stresses, it decreases our quality of life. And we know that Latinx communities are disproportionately impacted by air pollution. As um, Elizabeth mentioned, um, the air pollution is something that Latino communities are most impacted because the access to clean air, the water, soil are not equitable distributed. And as we are having more frequent and more extreme, the climate change is making those inequities even worse. And communities of colors, but also low income communities face the greatest health risk because they are the, for, the first, but also the most impacted by the air pollution. Because where we live, where we learned, we even work, and even our children are playing. So just to share you some statistics that has been shown these disparities in health equity, nearly 10 million Hispanic living counties that receive failing grade of ozone or particular pollution measures. But what does it mean this? These are people that are breeding uh, pollutants that are emitted from power plants or industries or cars or heavy duty uh, vehicles that are transiting every single day in our highways. And those are uh, small particles, small tiny um, particles, as I said, I'm so sorry, um, that they can be inhaled and can cause serious health problems. Are that tiny that less than our hair that we have. So they are very small. And these are the communities that, as the statistics have shown, one third of the US Latinos, or a translation of 23 million, are living in those countries that the air is not healthy and that are not meeting the health um, standards for, for a smoke. And even another statistic that has been very worrisome is that 3.3 million of US Hispanic live within one mile of active oil gas facilities, which can emit significant amounts of air pollution. So it's not just causing the problem to climate change, but also is creating the health directly to the communities that are uh, living in those places. So for these populations that are made vulnerable by social and economic circumstances, the stress of climate change takes a deeper toll. Because of historic racist housing policies such as redlining, Latino communities are more likely to live in areas that are vulnerable to climate impacts and disasters, exposing them to a much higher burden of stress and trauma from these impacts. So as you can see here, for example, in 2017, Hurricane Harvey hit low-income Hispanic and Latino communities in the Gulf the hardest. Mm -hmm. And 44% to 66% of Puerto Ricans displaced by Hurricane Maria in 2017 ended up developing PTSD. 
Now, like uh, likewise with um, wildfires, many of our Latino residents in the Western states face a much greater danger from these wildfires. And they're also twice as likely to live in areas most threatened by wildfires relative to the overall US population. What these statistics show is that Latino communities are disproportionately impacted by climate change. Increased heat waves being a primary concern because millions of Latinos have jobs that require them to be outside. Outdoor workers in the US are up to 35 times more likely to die from heat exposure than the general population. And urban neighborhoods or heat islands with greater concentrations of residents of color are also more likely to lack parks, natural areas, and other forms of green space. This is not only uh, increased heat risk, but it also deprives these communities of the mental health or buffer offered by these natural green spaces. These same communities have been disproportionately targeted for the siting of dangerous and polluting facilities as Carolina names some. These are toxic waste dumps, petrochemical plants, highways, and other sources of water and pollution. And not to mention that our Latino children are also unfairly impacted by learning disruptions when the temperatures rise. So another form uh, of mental health impacts that, occur, that can occur from climate change are what we might call indirect mental health impacts. And when we're talking about this, we're talking about impacts that are related to broader or more, more prolonged climate related changes. And this can include things like chronic stress, substance abuse, or even suicidal ideation among people whose livelihoods or food security are affected by, by drought. So that can uh, especially impact farmers and farm workers. Um, it can include ongoing disruption to healthcare systems, such as when there's repeated uh, climate-driven weather extremes, and this can break down the, the systems that provide uh, mental health care services. Uh, community uh, breakdown can occur over time with repeated disruption. And then another really important one to name is this, uh, what we would often call climate anxiety. It's a sense of fear, anxiety, or distress relating to uh, thinking about how climate change might impact us in the future, seeing headlines showing how it's impacting other people now, maybe worrying about what the, what the future will look like for our children. Um, and just one of many examples I could offer uh, on this front is this headline on the right from The Guardian. Uh, and it shows a photo of a woman um, in in Greece experiencing wildfires and you can see the look on her face is just one of, of deep anguish and this headline you know global climate crisis inevitable unprecedented irreversible um, you know I, I know that I can't see headlines like this without like feeling my own body tense up and my heart rate quicken um, they have an impact on us and we're we're seeing headlines like this with just human um, pain and suffering um, more and more and more often, and they have an impact on our mental health. And we know that climate distress is, uh, is really common. Um, there was a, a study uh, published in a, a medical journal called The Lancet uh, in 2021 of 10,000 young people around the world, so a very representative sample. Uh, and it showed that 84% of teens and young people aged 16 to 25 are at least moderately worried about climate change and nearly 60% reported being very or extremely worried. That's a really high number. Um, among adults, um, there's research showing that at least two in three adults that they experience at least some degree of climate anxiety. We know that this uh, number is higher in Latinx communities. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, and very recent data from the Yale program on climate change communication showed that about one in 10 uh, people in the U.S. report symptoms of anxiety related to global warming uh, for several or more days over the last two weeks. And so that's a level of anxiety that could meet um, diagnostic criteria for a clinical anxiety disorder. So we know that this, uh, that the emotional distress we're feeling uh, because of climate change is, is real and the impact is growing. So how many of you have heard the term eco-ansiedad? Eco-ansiedad or eco-anxiety is a term used for the sense of worry, fear, or tension related to climate change. And the list of these terms continue to grow. 
Yeah. And, you know, these are, these are words that name uh, feelings that we might be having even before we know there's a word for it, right? This is a really an emerging vocabulary. Um, as Liz said, you know, climate anxiety is one of the most common, but there's also experience, uh, the experience of climate grief, right? That might be a sense of loss arising from uh, experiencing or learning about uh, uh, the loss of beloved places due to climate change. Climate guilt is something that uh, many people feel um, you know, we all want to live lives that are as sustainable as possible. And very often it is quite difficult to do that. We may feel guilt or shame because of that. Uh, and then this word nostalgia was uh, coined by an Australian philosopher named Glenn Albrecht. And he describes this as the distress caused by environmental change. Uh, and I, it's really poignant the way he puts it, that it's the, the homesickness you have when you're still at home, right? When you can see that things are changing around you and home becomes... Uh, unfamiliar. And we wanted to take uh, a little bit of time to over to review some of the factors that can make people vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Um, you know, we can, all of us can and will feel the mental health impacts of climate change, but we know that the burden of these impacts is not distributed evenly. We know that communities of color are affected first and worst by, by climate impacts, and research shows that communities of color are the most concerned about climate change. You know, many indigenous communities experience unique mental health uh, impacts due to the loss of ancestral lands and the loss of um, uh, traditional ways of life. Um, communities living on the front lines of climate impacts may be more prone to the mental health impacts because they are really living through these direct impacts. So people living close to wildfires, hurricanes, sea level rise, extreme heat, people who work outdoors or who lack housing are especially vulnerable. People who are displaced from the place that they love and call home um, are vulnerable to mental health impacts. People who have fewer economic resources are more vulnerable as well. They may have, may have less ability to evacuate uh, for safety when there are disasters or less ability to, uh, to migrate if needed. Young people are an especially vulnerable population. They will bear the brunt of future climate impacts. And you know, as a mom of two young kids myself, I know that I find it really heartbreaking to, to know that young people will experience at least three times as many climate disasters uh, as their grandparents did. Um, LGBTQ communities, uh, especially youth, are um, vulnerable. They are disproportionately represented in the unhoused population, making them vulnerable to climate impacts. People who are older, who um, are disabled or have pre-existing chronic conditions may be more vulnerable because they may be less mobile when, when disasters strike. Uh, and women, you know, we know that um, that women are more worried about climate change than men in general, uh, and also that women and girls are disproportionately impacted by, by, by climate change. So the statistical clear is going to pause now for addressing uh, specifically for the Latino communities, and our community is very aware about climate change in the U.S., uh, compared with the non-Latinos. We have been reviewing some research like this one, for example, the climate change in the Latino mind. And they have been given this statistics about that our community is very aware. And another consistent pattern that it has been shown is that white Latinos in general are more engaged with issues of global warming than long Latinos, Spanish speakers that are Latinos even are even more engaged than the English speakers. It's kind of like uh, something uh, of curiosity of now that we wanted to address and prepare materials that we wanted to, to share with our community, uh, it's important to consider these things. And in terms of climate and frontline communities, as uh, we have uh, been seen, let me acknowledge that we needed to, to address them and also to share the urgency, but also the scale of the climate crisis. And we have to bring these communities because they're the most vulnerable and unfortunately are the ones that are contributing the less to the, to the impact of climate change. And it is a systemic uh, racism that has been given the burden that not just on the physical uh, health, but as it has been described 
uh, as Elizabeth and, and Liz, it is affecting our mental. And it is important uh, that we have to recognize that um, because it's increasingly, and it has been also increased because of COVID-19 as well. So it has been a lot of um, distress that have been causing our, our uh, mental health uh, issues. And unfortunately, the, the disaster, uh, when it happened a disaster, the eight, there is disparities of how it is being responded. So it's at adding a lot of layers of how the impacts of our mental health could be most impacted because of how we receive the response is not properly. So let's gonna go to the next one. Um, okay, so continue with this challenges. I don't wanna, my, my intention or our intention is not to provide you with so many layers about why it is important that we are addressing this in the Latino community, but it's important to acknowledge. And one of the things that we do it in Ecomadres is like how we can cover the access for bilingual information, bilingual resources that the people could be feel that they can be prepared when a disaster is going to happen. Because when you are aware about what is going to happen, it's reduced the stress and the trauma. And because as I mentioned it a little bit before, the disparity on access or resources when a disaster happens is very different uh, of how it's been responded in other communities. So as mental health is something that is can have a, a high stigma, it is very difficult to talk about it. So that's why in this uh, webinar, we wanted to invite our community to talk about it. And we know that uh, the effects that is happening in the in the climate, like extreme heat, especially with those uh, migrants or seasonal workers that are coming to the US, they are directly being impacted. And they depend, unfortunately, of the, of the wages and the labor that they come to this country to work with. And they have to stay longer hours outdoors and they are directly affected by the, the extreme heat that is happening and it's affected their mental health, not just the physical, but also the mental in their mood. And even they can create some psychiatric condition that can affect them. So I just wanna say that the effects of climate change on mental health is very well documented, but it can be difficult to find resources to address it. This is a fact. So now we want to shift the gears and Elizabeth now is going to share with us what are the opportunities for action that are available so we can prevent, address, and mitigate these threats. Thank you, Carolina. We wanted to just invite a moment to pause. We know that we've covered a lot of uh, intense uh, material over the last 20 minutes or so. So just take a moment to move your body, uh, get a sip of water, maybe take a deep breath. And as Carolina said, we are going to shift gears now to talk about what we can do about this. So we can uh, work with our climate distress on a number of different levels. And one of those ways is uh, on the individual level. So some of the ways to cope with things like climate anxiety or climate grief uh, is to acknowledge and validate your emotions. You know, as, as Liz and Carolina have been saying, you know, the, the fact that you're experiencing climate anxiety is a sign that you care, right? It's a sign that you're paying attention. It's a normal uh, response to what is actually happening in the world. It's not a sign that there's anything wrong with you. And so acknowledging and validating your emotional experience of climate change is really important. This is one of the things that's most important for supporting the young people in your lives. If you have, you know, kids or teens who are struggling with climate anxiety. Uh, we know that uh, they need their emotional experience validated as well. Another strategy is what we might call emotional coping tools. Um, these can be things like meaning-focused coping, which is um, 
uh, is looking at a situation honestly. So like acknowledging that climate change is extremely hard and extremely painful, but looking for ways to find meaning uh, even amidst what is hard and painful and looking for ways to, to show up for your own values amidst what's painful. Um, cultivating active hope and optimism is also um, a powerful strategy. And when, when we say active hope, we mean the kind of hope that comes from, from engaging and taking action on climate change uh, and really being someone who participates in climate solutions. Learning more about climate justice and finding ways to take action is powerful. We know that taking action with other people, collective action is especially beneficial for our mental health, more so than taking action by yourself. Engaging in self-care, again, you know, working on climate change, learning about climate change is it's emotionally intense, right? All of us who work or, or know very, even a little bit about climate change know that. And so taking care of ourselves is incredibly important uh, for many people. Embracing personally meaningful spiritual practices can be powerful, practicing gratitude and joy. Acknowledging that even amidst very hard times, there is still uh, there can still be beauty. Boosting personal preparedness is uh, is valuable, and so when we say this, we mean uh, having some knowledge about the the climate uh, disasters or extreme weather events that are likely to happen in your geographic area, and being as prepared as you can for them. So knowing what to do in an emergency, knowing that you have a plan, can help reduce anxiety. Um, and then monitoring your news consumption and limiting it uh, if necessary. Uh, I, none of us were built to take in terrifying headlines about the world 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And yet often, you know, we find ourselves doom scrolling on social media or just can't stop reading or listening to the news. And, and that has an impact on our mental health. So, you know, when it comes to coping with climate distress, a really powerful tool is to know, uh, know yourself well enough to know when it's time to turn off the news and care for yourself. Thank you, Elizabeth. So now let's switch gears and chat a little bit about what we can do as a community. Um, these are a lot of different strategies that have been shared um, by Eco America. And the first one being expanding disaster response and resili resiliency plans. So again, taking part in the community conversation, learning, first identifying what is even available um, in different situations and different um, stages of disaster and helping to build upon those and expand them. Um, another one is to increase social cohesion, including um, through programs and social infrastructure. So identifying opportunities near you, you know, whether it's at a park or community center, other uh, organizations that may be offering these spaces to come together and unite as a community. And talking about and addressing health disparities and other inequities. You know, we can't really remain silent about these disparities. We really have to acknowledge them, make more people aware about them so that equitable solutions can be enacted. Um, and including community voices in the planning efforts is particularly important. And this is, again, as Carolina noted, one of the many things that we aim to do here at Ecomadres is really to uplift and empower people to raise their voices, to bring forth their lived experiences um, and ensure that those who have been historically excluded and discriminated against have a, a chance to offer um, solutions and actually have a seat at the table. And in addition, strengthening mental health services, including making them more accessible and affordable is incredibly important for us to um, work at, as a community together. Also, we can help update physical infrastructure, including municipal services and healthy access to nature. Again, in working with those uh, decision makers and those um, you know, leaders in your community, really emphasizing the need for these things is important. Developing a trusted and effective multilingual warning and communication system. We've seen a lot of recent disasters, including just this past weekend in the Delaware River, um, where toxic chemicals were spilled and then the water of the nearby communities in Philadelphia were compromised. Communication wasn't clear, it wasn't timely, it wasn't effective, where people were uh, hearing about these things through Twitter before they actually heard about it from the official agencies. So we really need to expand um, on this and, and uh, provide it also in multiple languages so everyone has access to the same information. 
In addition, we can train people who will serve the community during a disaster. We need as many hands as we can, as we know we have to come together as a community in these times of crisis. Preparing and responding quickly for disaster, for post-disaster recovery. We've actually seen firsthand one of our organizers, um, Yaritza in Florida, you know, after the hurricane hit her hometown, she was there with her community helping to rebuild those who had, you know, either lost um, or had suffered the impacts of the hurricane coming through. So coming together again in the post, you know, aftermath is equally important. Now, I mentioned a few things um, about Eco Madres, and I'd love to share a little bit more about what we do and really invite everyone to come and join us. Um, regularly, we will host cafecitos within our um, different states where we have organizers and also locally here to the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, where we host these you know, interpersonal gatherings, just small groups coming together, creating that safe space where we can really embrace social connection and talk about these hard things, talk about the climate emotions with others. Again, noting that there might be this stigma within our community to talk about mental health or really to, you know, quote unquote, share our dirty laundry. Um, this actually creates that space where we can come together and talk about these difficult things. Additionally, make your voice heard. We say this so loudly to really help folks and feel empowered in sharing their voice, sharing their lived experiences and supporting solutions to reduce and prevent further climate change. Now, enjoying music. I can probably guarantee that everybody on this call today loves music. They have a personal collection to, connection to music, and that's really part of our cultural connection. Um, we have a very, very rich diversity as Latinos, as, um, as members of this community. And actually, because of that, last year, we created what we call Eco Madres Ensemble or Conjunto Eco Madres. So this was led by our um, state coordinator in Iowa, Karim Stein, who's been a musician for many years. She saw the power that there is in music and in bringing people together. And so just inspiring them through music to take action. So it doesn't have to be a somber experience. It can be something motivating and uplifting. And additionally, we need to get outdoors. Um, I think I saw some of our members from Latino Outdoors here, you know, really helping to get our communities out there, reconnecting with nature and celebrating our stories and our lived experiences is incredibly important to navigate this current time. So for that, I love this quote here by Jessica Hernandez. She's the writer of Fresh Banana Leaves, Healing Indigenous Landscapes Through Indigenous Science. If you haven't yet picked up this book, please do so. It provides wonderful, wonderful um, connection to you know, who we are and where we've come from. So it says, nature protects us as long as we protect nature. Nature is truly our greatest ally and we must all do what we can to protect it. And just remember that every single action counts. Thank you, Liz. Yes, every single action counts. And on the note of action, we wanted to share some ideas for, for policy change that will help address the mental health impacts of climate change. Uh, number one is we need policies that address uh, environmental justice. Uh, this is key to addressing the mental health impacts of climate change uh, in Latino communities and all communities. When it comes to policies that specifically address the intersection of climate change and mental health, uh, and name that specifically, there aren't a whole lot of uh, policies out there yet, um, but we're starting to see signs of that changing. Um, one potential policy policy is the Community Mental Wellness and Resilience Act that was introduced at the end of last year by uh, Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey, and this would authorize the CDC to fund uh, public health programs that address uh, uh, mental health at a population level, so really caring for communities. Uh, and then uh, one that we are especially excited about uh, is a house resolution called Promoting Youth Mental Health and Well-Being in a Changing Climate. Uh, this is the first uh, congressional resolution to address the impact of climate change on young people's mental health, and it will be uh, reintroduced tomorrow uh, here in D.C. Um, by uh, uh, Representative uh, Mike Thompson from California and Representative Kathy Castor from Florida. This resolution was written by high school students with a group called Schools for Climate Action, and we are um, with them this week here in D.C. to um, 
advocate for uh, our young people's right to have the mental health resources uh, that they deserve. So I hope that you will uh, learn more about this and, um, and support this policy as well. You're muted, Carolina. Oh, thank you. Um, we wanted to also share another a quote that is relevant for coming to the close of our conversation. And let me read it. Um, so we cannot afford to lose people in this work. And what includes to burn out and exhaustion. Care and repair is mandatory, part of successful movement, not a luxury. If we want to succeed, we must tend to our relationship with one another, our trauma as individuals and community recognize multi-generational wisdom, and nourish our creativity, art, and emotional health. So this is, was something that we wanted to share with you and something that we wanted to start the conversation because we recognize that this is some ch challenging times that everybody, not just in the U.S., but worldwide is experiencing. So we wanted to build this awareness, but also to provide these resources that has been shared in previous conversation. And as some people were doing in the chat, we're gonna be sharing with you the song that we have prepared with our colleague from a proud Colombian living in Iowa that she wanted to share her legacy or legado. And it is a call to inspire our community, a hope, a hope that we wanted to make a call to action to protect what we all, shared, which is our common home, but importantly, the health of our children, but also the future that we have. So let me share my screen. You cannot share? Well, okay. So now I can share it. So. And sorry for, let me see. So can, Oh. Aún te tengo aquí conmigo. Algún día partirá. Speak the voice. 
Okay, I couldn't stop, but it comes some, some uh, lágrimas. Um, um, let me see, I think that is still. I want to thank everybody again um, for joining us in the discussion. I know it was difficult at times, but we really hope that you walk away with this, um, you know, with an empowered feeling to take action, you know, for your communities now, but also for future generations. Um, I see a lot of people are active in the chat, so I just want to take these next few minutes to take any questions um, and actually join in discussion with you all and, and learn from you. You know, what other strategies help you care for yourself when it comes to climate change? We named a lot of them that we can do today as individuals and as communities, but there's so many different ways in which we can take care of our mental health. So I invite you again, type it in the chat or if you can come off mute, let us know. Um, I know one thing I love doing, um, I'm a mother of four myself, ages six all the way to 14. Um, so we just really love to get outside. Again, for me, reconnecting with nature is absolutely the best way that I can ground myself. I can remember and see the beauty in this world and, you know, encourage my kids at the same time to take care of the land, to take care of their communities and have them, however it may be, whether it's picking up, you know, one piece of uh, trash that they see in our walks, but really, like I said, any little action that they can do and helping them, um, you know, feel empowered to do more is something that helps me cope with any of this uh, talk about climate change. Carolina, what's something that you do? No, thank you, Liz. Um, well, actually, that's the reason that I joined uh, Moms Cleaner for and Ecomadres, because given the, the things that are happening, I said, like, okay, let me join a community that are with the same values, with the same priorities that I have. And of course, that we share being in the outdoors and how to share the emotions that are flourish. And it is important to acknowledge that and to bring hope. That's what basically wanted to, to portray that hope is the way that we can act. And we and with the things that we care. Um, I am not a mom, but I have a lot of nephews, nieces, and I am a godmother. So it doesn't have to be like a motherhood uh, in order to join our community, but just the common goal that we wanted to protect our communities and we wanted to create a future that we always enjoy with the future generations and how important is that we can do it all together. So, so that's what I am like very excited that we are partnering with Latino Advocacy Week and with the Hispanic Access Foundation because we have the same uh, purpose that is to provide information and how we can support our communities. So, I'm not sure whether there are questions. There are like a lot of uh, input. Um, Elizabeth Bechard, if you want to, you can share uh, in case that um, there is a question that we needed to answer. Um, yeah, I think we we were really curious to hear what y'all do to support your mental health. Um, I'll chime in and then I hope uh, someone from the audience will as well. And just to say that for me, talking with other people about my climate distress has been profoundly helpful. I know that when I first started really feeling climate anxiety um, after becoming a mom several years ago, uh, I felt really alone and, you know, would sort of read terrifying books and watch terrifying videos and sort of sit alone in my house, you know, wondering like what was happening to the world. But, you know, as Carolina and Liz have, have uh, mentioned, you know, when we connect with other people, it's, it's really, it really makes such a huge difference. Um, 
I'm wondering if any of y'all would be willing to share what what supports you. And if they want to open their camera, I'm very happy that um that we can see you or just talk. Um, and I just noticed that Margarita Flores is on the audience and she has been a very good uh, friend to be able to articulate an open letter uh, for women of faith, women of color to say it like that faith is also, as I mentioned it previously, that we wanted to care our common home. So, so I'm very happy that Margarita uh, was able to join us in this important conversation. So, so open the... Well, I would love to share yeah. what Jose has put in the chat. He writes, living in dense, polluted communities is hard. So I also go to nature and cleaner areas to reconnect and imagine my own community as clean and natural. I also get comfort in learning and studying the work of contemporary and historical indigenous people who have had many reasons to give up, but never did. That is incredibly powerful. Thank you so much, Jose, for naming that and, and sharing that. I think many of us in this call um, can really benefit from reconnecting to our, our natural lands and definitely encourage everyone to do so when they can. And also Shana, like uh, others that I wanted to, to portray their their activities through things to do with their hands, like a jewelry craft or doing some worship uh, in a way of being able to have some creativity to be opened and to relax themselves. And also Lorena reconnected with tradition that embrace air care is the best things I do to address echo stress. Well, I'm very happy that we have a very active audience um, and we're happy to, to be connected, at uh, least put it there, our website. We wanted to see that uh, this one, it could be the, the beginning of conversation that we wanted to have more and, and able to articulate resources that are gonna be benefiting you. Um, Montserrat, thank you. Painting outdoors and journalism, my worries. Okay. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's what it remind me the the art that our colleague Jaritza from Florida did it when it was happening the hurricane in her community. And she did it a beautiful uh, art of the of a logo of Ecomadres. So it's like uh, just chan channeling our abilities or our creativity for something that it can portray our our pain, but it can portray something beautiful like art. And I see that Anna wrote working with our communities to raise awareness about the climate issues we're facing as Latinos. So thank you, Anna. Anna is our wonderful uh, state coordinator in New Mexico, doing such great work for our Latino communities as part of Eco Madres, and of course, representing Moms Clean Air Force. So again, we really, really invite you all to continue these conversations at home, in your community, wherever it's appropriate, or you can create that space to, to have these conversations. Um, we want to continue in advocating for people speaking up, for those uh, who haven't felt empowered to feel empowered and having these difficult conversations. Um, really everything it lays in a foundation of bringing awareness and education to our communities so that we can fight for equitable solutions. So thank you all so much for tuning in with us and being so lively in the chat. We hope that you can reach out to us. Um, again, we will certainly follow up with materials after this call, but you can go to Ecomadres uh, .org to follow us and learn a little bit more. You can find us on social um, and then you'll be able to see as well where we have um, local chapters so that you can tune in possibly to a future cafecito. So thank you all once again. And just to close, uh, this uh, conversation is being recorded. My understanding is that for those signing will be received this recording, but also we're putting together some materials that will be helpful with the with the conversation. And we are very open. We have also a, a general email that you can send your questions and and also comments, suggestions that uh, that we can help to to build up uh, resources or trainings as needed. So thank you so much. And Elizabeth Bechard, last words. 
I think y'all have covered it. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Lorena's um, question to chat the best state community locally and uh, okay. that we will include resources and follow up that gives some ideas on that. There are some great um, climate support groups out there. And if there's not one in your area, there are ways to start one in your area. So um, we'll include those resources uh, and following up as well. Great. Um, so Evelyn, let us know um, if there's something else that we can do or you're gonna close the, the session. Okay, so.